and the Romans are not done for us. Hello and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. My name's Neil, I'm your host, and in this episode I'm going to talk about the city of Thebes in ancient Greece. I'm going to start with a foundation myth, or myths, and take you through to the early 5th century BC, just after the Persian invasion force has been defeated by the Greek allies. In later episodes, I'm going to continue the story of Thebes, so keep an ear and an eye out, and it's even more reason if you haven't already, to subscribe to my podcast. As ever, I'll be putting episode notes up on my website, that's ancientblogger.com, so you can find links to further reading, articles I've cited, and other content such as maps and diagrams. And there's also links to my Facebook, Insta, and Twitter on there. I hope you enjoy this episode, and I'm going to start by taking you back to the mythical past of Thebes. The foundation of Thebes isn't a complete and cogent myth, which comes neatly wrapped with a bow on top and this probably won't surprise you. Many Greek myths vary, and even the ones we are familiar with, for example, the fall of Troy, are sometimes just the best known version rather than the only version. Rather than for straight, I think this makes the myths more fun, because there's a question as to why the variations exist. And I say that because what doesn't quite fit about the myth of Thebes makes it even more interesting, but I'll get to that later on. I'll start then, Perhaps where you might not expect, not near Thebes, or in Greece, or even in Europe, though cryptically Europe does have a part to play. We start in the Phoenician city of Tyre, which is in modern-day Lebanon. It was in Tyre that it all began. One day Europa, daughter of King Agenor, was playing with friends when she was abducted by Zeus in the form of a bull, who carried her to Crete on his back. And just as an aside, it was Europa who bore several famous children on Crete, including King Minos, and it's from her that we get the word Europe, hence my poor attempt at being cryptic a few moments ago. Being a princess, her disappearance caused a furor, and her brother Cadmus set out to find out what had happened to her. Presumably, he'd put two and two together and realised that it was most likely Zeus who was involved, especially as it involved an animal, which Zeus often took the form of. As such, he made his way to Greece, and specifically to the oracle at Delphi. The oracle advised him not to worry about his sister, and instead he should found a city. Now, as you might reason, this wasn't a small thing. Just imagine packing for a two, perhaps three week at best holiday, and then being told you're going to live there. Actually, you need to found a city there. The oracle advised him to follow a cow, and there's some variation on how Cadmus came to recognise the cow. In some myths, it was identifiable by a mark on its flank, and in others, they just don't mention that. In either case, Cadmus, when he saw the cow in question, was to follow it until it lay down to rest. It was there that he would found the city. Shortly after leaving the oracle, he came across the cow in question and followed it until it rested. And in case you're wondering... It's about 100 kilometres, that 62 mile journey from Delphi to Thebes, which suggests that the cow was incredibly fit, or certainly in good condition. When Cadmus founded the city, he named it after himself, Cadmia. He also sacrificed the poor cow, which, when you think about it, had done most of the work up until this point, so sort of feel sorry for it. Part of the sacrificial ritual involved sourcing some water from a nearby spring. This didn't go particularly well. His followers went to get the water, but were ambushed by a serpent. And this wasn't just any old serpent, or sometimes a dragon. It was the son of Ares. When his comrades didn't return, Cadmus went to the spring, defeated the dragon, or serpent, and then Athena said to him, why don't you sow the teeth into the soil? And he did. And from it, men sprang. And these were known as Spartoi. These aren't to be confused, by the way, with Spartans, though... From their following actions, I suppose you could say they're pretty much fitting well there. The Spartoi immediately started fighting amongst each other, and sometimes this is actually agitated by Cadmus, who threw a stone in amongst them, and eventually only five were left standing. And it was from these Spartoi, or sown men, that the noble families of Thebes claimed descendancy from. As you might know from various other myths, killing a son of a god doesn't often do you particularly well, and Cadmus was 
fated to serve Ares for eight years, but afterwards he was rewarded with a marriage to Harmonia. As you might have guessed, her name is where we get Harmony from. And there's a bit of irony about that, and it's because she was born out of an affair. Her mother Aphrodite was actually married to Hephaestus, the crafting god, but her dad was Ares, who seems to have consistently been bed-hopping with Aphrodite. There's quite a famous scene in Homer where Hephaestus builds a sort of contraption that catches them in bed, and all the gods run in and have a good laugh at them both. Hephaestus, though lacking the sort of physicality to respond to the situation, particularly when Ares was involved, still had a grudge to bear, and it was never a good idea to have a god of any ability who was out to get you. And so it occurred. The wedding between Cadmus and Harmonia was one of the first big weddings of Greek myth. As I said, possibly the first. All of the gods were invited. You've got gods, you've got a wedding, you've got the basics for a lot of drama. To start with, Hephaestus gave Harmonia a necklace, but it wasn't an ordinary one. Instead, this one became known as the Necklace of Harmonia, which sounds quite nice. But in fact, it was fated to bring bad luck and civil strife to the descendants of the person who wore it. Just to give you an example, Jocasta, the mother of Oedipus, owned it, and I possibly don't need to say much more than that. The other drama involved the goddess Demeter and a titan. Whilst the wedding went on, the pair slunk away and hooked up in a nearby field. Zeus, who knew a thing or two about not that kind of stuff, noted the mud on Demeter's dress when she returned and put two and two together. Zeus punished the Titan by blasting him with a thunderbolt, but Demeter also had a consequence out of it. She fell pregnant, and she gave birth to the god Plutus, who was the god of wealth. Bad gifts, people hooking up, and a link to money. It's as if those Olympians really got the mortal experience of weddings. Whilst the couple had tied the knot, the myth of Thebes didn't end there. Sometime later, twin sons of Zeus, Amphion and Zethus, came to rule at Thebes, and they built the famous walls there. For Zethus, this was tough manual work, but Amphion had a trick. He was such an accomplished musician that his playing of the lyre charmed the stones into place. Both twins eventually married, and Zethus named the city Thebes after his bride Thebe. There's a lot to unpack here and the sources often contradict each other because of a dual foundation, or two myths, which seem to have, well, little interaction with each other. You've got Cadmus founding the city, and the twins also founding it by building the walls and naming it. With Cadmus, we have a story of a foreign king and his followers who initially established a city. This is linked to the Acropolis of Thebes, which became known as the Cadmia. When I say Acropolis, you're probably thinking of Athens, but an Acropolis is a feature of Greek cities, where a higher point was initially fortified and became the central component of that city. As the myth starts in Tyre, we are reminded that Cadmus was from the east, and his name has been argued as having an etymology which embodies this. His name might translate as from the east, but in fact it was even more of a link to the east, as Cadmus is thought to have been a Phoenician name. And this brings up the subject of language, which Cadmus was famous for, and specifically, the alphabet. The Greek alphabet didn't come about in a vacuum. It was developed from the Phoenician alphabet. If you look at the first word of the Phoenician alphabet, it's the letter A on its side. Cadmus was associated with this, perhaps symbolically, as he was Phoenician. This link between Cadmus and the alphabet seems to have been widely accepted in antiquity. Herodotus actually argued for it, and much later Tacitus, the Roman historians, agreed, though Josephus cocked a snoop at the whole thing and considered that the Greeks, they were just trying to lay claim to it and therefore extend their grand history backwards, a bit of revisionism to make themselves seem all that bit more important. Yet there is an object which steps out of myth, and it's something which physically existed and links language and the yeast, and it's called the Cassite Cylinder, and this was found in the Cadmian Palace on the Acropolis, as it were, of Thebes. The cylinder has a cuneiform script on the outside, along with what's thought to be a depiction of the god Marduk, and I'll put this in my episode notes. It was found, as I said, on the Mycenaean Palace on the Cadmia, and it dates to around the late 13th century BCE. It's a great example of where myths can sometimes point to a truth, in this case the link, whatever form it took, between Thebes and Mesopotamia. It's also a reminder that distance didn't prevent cultures from interacting. But what of the Spartoi? What does defeating a serpent or dragon 
and then sowing its teeth do other than provide a nice bit of drama? Well, the motif here pivots on a word I can never seem to say correctly, and even less smell. Autochthonic. This roughly translates as people coming from the earth, and the idea here was that it imbued a balance of the foreign, through Cadmus, with the local in the form of the Spartoi, who came from the very earth of Thebes, and as I said, whose descendants were the noble families there. Both serpents and autochthonic are elements found elsewhere in Greece. In one myth set in Athens, the early mythical king called Cecrops was said to have sprung from the earth, and he was also half-snake. And you might know at Delphi, the founding of the oracle there involved a myth where Apollo slayed a serpent. The Cadmian element of the myth does sit awkwardly with what happened next, and by that I mean the involvement of Amphion and Zephyrs. What the twins bring to the myth is the building of the walls and the naming of the city. Though the former, the building of the walls, might seem ancillary to us, it was a very important concept. To give an example, in the Iliad, Homer has Poseidon state that Troy became a city when he encircled it with a wall. The act of building walls had an association with the city being founded, OK, I'm looking at you, Sparta, for being different again. But what we have here are two separate myths, which both lay claim to founding the city, albeit in slightly different ways. The Cadmian myth is a wider myth explaining the location of this city and setting the roots for a line of myths, as well as certain cultural associations. The myth of Amphion and Zethus is bound to the walls and the naming of Thebes, but not much else. To find a bit of clarification in the sources, isn't as easy as you might think, and in fact, in many ways, it confuses the matter. I'll give you an example. The oldest surviving reference to Thebes occurred when Odysseus in the Odyssey travelled to the underworld and saw the mother of the twins, that is, Zethus and Amphion, and about the twins, he commented, These two founded the city of Thebes, the city of seven gates, and walled it round, since for all their prowess they are unable to inhabit so vast a city unfortified. In the Iliad, the people of Thebes are called Cadmians, though Cadmus isn't referred to as the founder of Thebes, and as one argument goes, the use of Cadmians might simply be the word used to refer to people of Thebes, and nothing much else. But what certainly is consistent is the connection Thebes had with its walls. Hesiod, a poet thought to be working around the same time as Homer, also wrote of seven gated Thebes, and in the Iliad the city of Thebes is notable, again because of its walls. In the reading list, there's a very interesting piece on how the walls of Thebes were referred to in the Iliad in different ways, to give contrast to Troy and its famous walls. Thebes became strongly associated with its walls, then and the famous Seven Gates. The walls were therefore not just a central part of it, but also its most notable feature. Exactly which myth came first, and how to consolidate these two myths, isn't a conundrum left to us in the modern period. In the 5th century BC, a writer called Pherecydes wrote about the foundation myth of Thebes in his work called the Boetica. Apologies for my pronunciation there. Other writers such as Hellanikos and Akusaleos also wrote on this, although Akusaleos wrote a bit earlier. Though their writings on this didn't survive, they were cited by later writers, for example Apollodorus, so we do have something to go on. Pherecydes supported the view that it was the twins who first walled Thebes, he was also the source who named the sown men as the Spartoi, and even named them individually. Pherecydes flipped the chronology. He has the walls built first by the twins, with Cadmus turning up later. Pausanias, writing much later in the 2nd century CE, reasoned that Cadmus came first and established this city on the Acropolis, the Cadmia, and later the twins walled the lower section, and thus Thebes was founded. But perhaps trying to align the two myths into one cogent one is the mistake made here. One argument has it that each myth belonged to a particular era of Thebes and reflected their respective values, the values that is, of that time. As such, the twins are a Mycenaean foundation myth. The Cadmian myth was developed much later on, in the late Archaic period, which is why Homer and Hesiod weren't really aware of Cadmius being the founder, but he still had some association there. There were still parts of the myth which were called into question, though. Plato was quite dismissive about the idea that men sprang from the soil following the sowing of the dragon's teeth, which, in fairness, is reasonable. Indeed, the philosopher even used the word cadmian to denote a situation involving more loss than gain, the reference here being that the Spartoi initially fought each other with only a few standing at the end. I suppose it's a sort of pyrrhic victory. 
The myths are undoubtedly a really important part of Thebes. But as with the Cassite cylinder, there is thankfully evidence which is a bit more tangible. Next, I'm going to talk about what physical and archaeological evidence we have about Thebes. But as you'll hear, the physical remains of ancient Thebes are never far from its myth. And just before I get to that, here's a promo from a podcast you might be interested in. Hello, fellow ancient history lovers. My name is Keith Hernandez, and I host the Badass Stories from Byzantium podcast, where every month it is my goal to tell the stories from the Eastern Roman Empire that you haven't heard and won't soon forget. In Badass Stories from Byzantium, I focus on themes rather than chronology, and it is through this approach that I hope you leave your headphones with a better understanding on why this great empire deserves a seat at the pop culture table. You can help in this endeavor by listening to Badass Stories from Byzantium wherever you're listening to this podcast. Follow Badass Stories from Byzantium on whichever social media platform you prefer. All of my handles are under Badass Byzantium. My next full episode will be released April 10th, and in it, I once again plan to get very bubonic. Hope to see you all soon, and remember, truth is the soul of history. Thanks to Badass Stories from Byzantium there. If you're a history podcaster and want to swap promos, just give me a shout. It's argued that originally a group of people lived on the plains around what would be Thebes, and at some point joined forces and fortified a natural outcrop of rock. This makes sense. Hilltops were much easier to defend, and they gave you a good way of seeing what was going on all around you. The hilltop in question became known as the Cadmia. It's an oval shape running on a north-south axis. The southern part is the widest at around 1.2 kilometres, and the north pinches in to half a kilometre. In the Mycenaean period, which is the date range of around 1600 to 1200 BCE, Thebes became an established city and a leading Mycenaean centre in ancient Greece. On the Cadmia was housed what's known as the palace complex, and it was here that the city was administered and ruled from. At some point, a defensive wall was built around it. The best preserved parts date to as early as 1300 BCE, but there's no reason to think that an earlier wall didn't exist. Exactly how the palace complex looked is tricky at best, given that there was various stages of building and rebuilding. What can be attested to is the wide variety of finds there. It wasn't just cylinders from the Near East. A type of vase known as stirrup jars from Crete were there, and in fact, a lot of Cretan artefacts have been found. Along with these, tablets were also discovered. These were written in Linear B, a type of Greek script, and these referred to goods in the cities, places and people. For example, Euboa, an island nearby, was recorded as being under the control of Thebes. Orlis, the port from which the Greek force sailed to Troy, was also under the control of Thebes. And there was even a record which included the line, to the son of a Lacedaemon. I suppose that's what they would have called a Spartan. Workshops were based there, either to create goods for internal consumption or to export. So the Cadmia wasn't just where a mythical king might hang out. It was a busy administrative centre. Estimates for its size are just that, but Professor Cartledge suggested a figure of around five to 6,000 at this time. But like most good things, it didn't last. Around 1200 BCE, everything stopped. Thebes fell to what's been called the Mycenaean Collapse, an event where Mycenaean centres stopped functioning. What caused this isn't clear, it's still debated now, and in fact, if you're interested in reading a bit about that, there's a very good book by Eric Klein called 1177 The Year Civilization Collapsed. When archaeologists excavated parts of the Cadmia dating to this period, they found a thick layer of burnt debris. A huge fire had taken hold of the palace complex, which destroyed it. Though the cause isn't known, the devastation it's left was understood by later generations in a familiar way. That is, it became a myth, and one associated with the god Dionysus. The story of Dionysus and his link to Thebes involved his mother Semele. She was a mortal who, well, surprise, surprise, had an affair with Zeus. After falling pregnant with him, she was approached by Zeus' wife Hera, who said that she should really ask Zeus to reveal himself in his full godliness. And as you might expect, this had a hidden agenda, because no mortal could withstand this, and Hera had set it up as a sort of, well, you know, if he's really into you, then of course he'll do it. Zeus eventually obliged Semele, and turned her and her home into a pile of smouldering ash. Dionysus was saved by Zeus and transplanted his thigh until he was born, because, 
Well, that's the sort of thing you can do when you're the king of the gods. When Euripides featured this myth as part of his play The Bacchae, he has Dionysus begin the play and point out where the ruins of his mother's house still stood and was considered off-limits to humans. No one was allowed to walk on it. Euripides' play dates to the end of the 5th century BCE, but even in the time of Pausanias, who wrote in the 2nd century CE, so several centuries later, this apparently was still the case. No one was allowed to walk there. It's an ingenious interpretation by those who lived in Thebes to have taken a very physical event and bind it to a myth which centred on their own city. And Thebes had no short amounts of myth to work with. Heracles, or Hercules, was born here. It was a place Oedipus came to rule. And then there's a tale of the Seven Against Thebes, a myth centred on revenge and where Thebes was laid siege to. And it's a myth which narratively predates Troy. If, like me, you're a bit of a fan of Diomedes, well, his father featured in the myth, and it's referenced a few times in Homer's Iliad. The Seven Against Thebes is worth mentioning because it established Thebes as a place associated with walls and siege much before Troy. The myth takes place after Oedipus has gone, and he's left his two sons to rule there, Eteocles and Polynices. Two brothers ruling a city would have been a difficult thing, even if there wasn't a cursed necklace sitting on the dressing table. And the two ruled in consecutive years, but when it was Eteocles' turn to hand over to Polynices, he decided not to, and this led to war. Polynices led a team of heroes, the famous Seven, against Thebes, and this included Tydeus, the father of Diomedes, who I mentioned earlier. The result was both brothers killing each other and Creon taking charge at Thebes. It didn't stop there. Creon prevented the proper burial of Polynices, and this was the backdrop to the play Antigone. Thebes was a rich source of drama and disaster. If Thebes was one of your friends, it would be the friend who always ends up in bizarre and dramatic situations. You know the one, hopefully minus the incest and death. Moving from the Mycenaean period, I'll jump forward a few centuries to the Archaic period. The Archaic period roughly covers the 7th century BCE through to the Persians in the early 5th century BCE. Though Thebes had been laid low by the Mycenaean collapse, it was certainly not down and out. By the end of the Archaic period, it had around 10,000 people living there and was beginning to flex its muscles, though not against who you might think. It's in the Archaic period where the lower walls of Thebes are thought to have been built. These were as big, if not bigger, than anything at the time. One estimate had the circuit of the measuring seven kilometres in length and encompassing an area of 328 hectares. Now, if, like me, you're one of those people who have no frame of reference to what a hectare looks like, it's a square measuring 100 metres by 100 metres. A modern-day soccer or football pitch is between 0.62 and 0.82 hectares, and an American football pitch is roughly half a hectare. The speculation about when the walls were built and what they looked like continues today due to the lack of ruins, so we're really left to the sources to give us an idea of what was present. Homer described Thebes, as I mentioned earlier, as the city ringed with walls. Hesiod, in his poems The Shield of Achilles and Works and Days, referred to the seven-gated Thebes. Theognis, writing about 540 BCE, included well-walled Thebes in his poetry. Just try saying that a few times. So what's this all-dramatic license? Possibly. It would be a bit of a hard sell to have a common association with the city and walls, only for the city not to have them. The rationale of having big walls makes sense beyond any myth when you take into account what was happening for Thebes around this time. The archaic period was witness to Thebes sizing up the cities and towns around it, and tensions between Thebes and its neighbours came to define it in a number of ways. The word polis is commonly used in ancient Greece, and it refers to a city-state where one city rules an area around it, for example, the area Athens oversaw was Attica. For Thebes, the area was called Boeotia. This incorporated a number of cities, and Thebes didn't have the advantage of effortlessly ruling over them as Athens did with Attica. Chief among the problems it had were two places, Orchomenos and Plataea. The latter you may have heard of, perhaps not Orchomenos. This was northwest of Thebes and the other side of Lake Capes. Though Boeotia wasn't a homogenous entity, it had a shared cultural base. Boeotians were easily identified by their dialects according to the sources, and Boeotian pig or Boeotian swine was apparently a common term of abuse. There may be a basis for Boeotians being thought of as a distinct set of people, 
Though we have the foundation myth of Thebes, we also have arguments that originally the Boeotians lived further north, near Thessaly. They then moved south, giving their name to the land they settled. Homer identified a number of the fighters of Troy as Boeotian, but only one of them, Penelaos, got to speak, and it's when he has a head on a spear and is taunting the Trojans. In the catalogue of ships section, effectively the part of the poem which is a roll call, Boeotians supplied 50 ships each with 120 men, which, as you've just worked out, is 6,000 men. The roll call featured 29 Boeotian locations, but interestingly, Orchomenos is listed separately. Either Homer was reflecting a current political fallout between the two, or imagining a time where Orchomenos wasn't considered Boeotian. It's difficult to get a decisive read on anything here, but it does carry the motif of Boeotia as a place with a number of independent places, but under the umbrella of Boeotia. But not all Boeotian towns were happy with this, and this all came to a head with a town called Patea. This is a town seven and a half miles south of Thebes, but though it was still in Boeotia, Plataea sat near the border with Attica, the region which was ruled by Athens. It was only 28 miles or so from Athens. In fact, Athens was only 30 miles from Thebes, which is very close. As you'd expect, Athens and Thebes weren't by any means unknown to each other. Towards the late 6th century BC, Athens was ruled by the Pisistratids, which was a family of tyrants. It started with Pisistratus and passed to his sons. Things weren't always smooth, and prior to his death in 527 BCE, Pisistratus had been temporarily kicked out of Athens, and whilst he plotted his return, Thebes was happy to back him financially. City-states playing politics was, and is nothing new, and the following events certainly exemplified this. The lead-up isn't exactly clear, so we don't know what brought them to this bold decision, but Patea had had enough of Thebes, and though it was in Boeotia, it wanted an alliance outside of it. The unlikely agent in all of this is Sparta, and I mean that because the standard view is that Sparta kept itself to itself, and wasn't that bothered by international affairs. But Plataea was able to make this appeal directly to one of the Spartan kings, Cleomenes, who was in the area at the time. The suggested date for all of this is 519 BCE, when Cleomenes, as I said, was in the area, and this presented him with a dilemma. The benefits were that Sparta would have a footing north of their traditional power base, might also bring offers from other cities, and Plataea could be a very nice piece of leverage to have with both Athens and Thebes. However, a more cunning plan was to come into play. Cleomenes declined the offer, stating that, in practical terms, they couldn't be much help as Sparta was quite a distance away, and this is very true. But the clever part was to suggest Athens as an alternative replacement. Why would Sparta suggest Athens? Well, we can't be sure of Cleomenes' motives, but it's very plausible that Sparta was playing a long game by pitching Athens and Thebes, close neighbours, remember, at each other's throats. The result was that Plataea appealed to Athens and an alliance was formed. This outraged Thebes. What had been an internal Boeotian dispute had now escalated. Thebes sent a force to Plataea, which was intercepted by one from Athens and defeated. There's always a challenge to say something along the lines of, this was a turning point, but the treason, as Thebes saw it, was to shape Theban attitudes to Athens and elsewhere for a long time. A good example is when the Persians homed into view. In the early 5th century BC, Greeks fought Persia in a number of battles. Some of these are household names, for example, Marathon, Thermopylae and Salamis. If there's a Greek in a battle on TV sporting minimal clothing and honed abs, then the chances are he's fighting a Persian. The first of these encounters took place in 490 BC at Marathon, which sat on the eastern shore of Attica. The Persian force which landed there was met by a smaller Greek force, and beaten, the fallout from this was huge. For the Greeks who had fought, it was a great victory. Perhaps for the Persians, it was viewed in less weighty terms. Theirs was um, an expeditionary force, which had just, you know, been beaten back a bit. They would be back, and they certainly were. That the Greek force was able to push back a larger force was impressive, but it wasn't just about numbers. I say Greek force, but only two locations provided the men who fought. This was Athens and Plataea. The Spartans, due to religious observance, were late and so missed out. For Athens, there was glory, but there was also a bit more to it. Athens had just started with a brand new political experiment, democracy, and it was their first big win under it. But I don't want it to be all about Athens, which is what Athens is very good at doing. Think about the fact that Plataea joined them. 
A thousand men has been suggested, which is around a tenth of what Athens supplied, and according to Herodotus, the Plataeans were placed on one of the wings. So it's worth wondering, without those thousand men, would Athens simply have found it too much of an ask, and history would have been very, very different. The second invasion by Persia occurred ten years later, and Thebes was present, but also not present. In 480 BCE, Xerxes, the Persian king, had led a massive force into Greece and to a pass at Thermopylae. The narrow pass was bolstered by a force of several thousand Greeks, who came from various city-states, the most well-known being Sparta, and one of their kings, Leonidas. But also present were 400 Thebans and 700 th soldiers from Thespae, both Boeotian locations. Thespae had made a break from its fellow Boeotian cities and joined the Greeks against the Persians, whilst Thebes had sided with the Persians and sent no one. The 400 Thebans were outliers. Herodotus says they were in fact hostages taken by Leonidas to ensure that Thebes stayed well behaved, even if it did nothing. But this doesn't seem to be as plausible as the notion that these were men who felt the cause of defending Greece against the Persians to overrule any city-state squabbles. Both the men from Thespae and the Thebans stayed to the last man, and this had implications for Thespae. Though Thespae, thinking ahead, had evacuated many of its citizens, when the Persians won and continued south, they set the place on fire. Plataea had also committed men, not to Thermopylae, but to a naval battle at Artemisium, and their city shared the same fate as that of Thespae. But as Thebes had behaved well, well apart from those Thebans who had joined at Thermopylae, the Persians let the city be. In fairness to Thebes, it was in a difficult position. Only a few city-states north of Athens stood against the Persians, and after the Persians continued their march and took Athens, it might have seemed the wrong decision to try and oppose them. But as we know, there was one final twist. After a resounding Persian defeat at Salamis, the remaining Persians retreated into mainland Greece. It was here that a final, massive battle took place the Battle of Plataea. The best spin that you could give Thebes up until this point was that it would be neutral, perhaps biding its time to have a change in heart and charge over the horizon to come to the age of the Greeks. But as the Allied Greek force lined up at Plataea to face the Persians, they might have recognised a few faces. Soldiers from Thebes and other Boeotian locations stood in the ranks of the enemy across them on the battlefield. According to Herodotus, these men were even set across from the Athenians. I wonder if it was a bit of a personal touch. Plataea was a victory for the Greeks. It was hard won and bloody. In the course of ten years, the Persian threat had been faced down and its weaknesses laid bare. True, it could amass a large force which would drink rivers dry as it marched, but it lacked a sense of collective unity, and this had been a dynamic which ran through the Greek allied force, Again, true, they squabbled and the accounts often chime with fallouts between the Greek commanders, but unification had ultimately worked. A spark had been lit here as to what could be achieved if they all tried to get along for more than five minutes. The concern over Persia continued, and in the years following, the Greeks united to form the Delian League, which sought to defend itself against Persia. Of course, Greek city-states being Greek city-states, it wasn't long before this led to infighting. And ironically, you can draw a line from the Greeks defending themselves against an empire to creating the Athenian one, and then fighting each other. But what about Thebes? How do you deal with a city-state who'd initially shown neutrality in the face of the Persian threat, and then committed troops to support it and fight against fellow Greeks? After the battle, the Spartan leader Pausanias took a force to the city and besieged it. The intention wasn't to raise or sack the city, that wasn't something Greeks favoured much at the time. Instead, the pro-Persian leaders there needed to be excised. But siegecraft at this time in Greece wasn't one involving large towers or engines and ladders being thrown up against walls. Instead, siegecraft involved the force encircling the city and destroying crops and buildings in the areas outside. It was also a psychological affair. In tandem with what's going on outside of the city, the besieging army would be looking to recruit any sympathetic factions within the city who could lead a revolt there or just simply leave the odd gate unlocked. The Greeks savaged the area around Thebes 20 days. Those famous walls were now host to farmers and people who lived outside of the city watching as everything they had was destroyed. 
This and the internal pressures forced the leaders of Thebes who'd backed the Persians to submit. And in fairness, with the Persians in full retreat, there wasn't much else they could do. Herodotus wrote that leaders expected that they might be able to bribe the Spartans into lowering whatever sentence they had decided. This didn't work, though there may have been concern that somehow they would be successful, as Pausanias took no risk. He marched them straight off to Corinth and had them executed. Though it received judgment in one sense, Thebes was never going to escape the reputation it now had. No matter what it did following Plataea, the stain of its Persian alliance was going to stay with it. And there's a sense of life imitating myth here. Thebes was the place where Heracles killed his family and was sentenced to his labours. It was where an abandoned child called Oedipus killed his father and married his mother. It wasn't as if mythical Thebes lacked the experience of dealing with stigma. In the next episode, or most likely episodes on Thebes, I'll continue from here and get into the 5th century BCE proper. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. I don't have any sort of marketing budget, so it also helps. And you can also come and say hi. I'm on Twitter, at Ancient Blogger, and as I said earlier, my website is ancientblogger.com. Until next time, keep safe and stay well.